So again, just revive your motivation. Even if you're just thinking for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings. Okay. So um, with the three lower realms, uh, we're really talking about these a little bit heavier negative states of mind, um, like miserliness, like hatred, um, like ignorance. And these ones, um, you know, when you're identifying them, they're very easy to slip into the trap of feeling bad about yourself for having them. So just, you know, keep remembering we are not our negative states of mind. They are temporary, they are removable, they are not us. So identifying them isn't like picking out faults in yourself. It's just seeing like problematic ways of thinking so that they can move on. Um, so it's really important to keep coming back to this uh, mental attitude of any time we see a way of thinking that's not working for us, to not over-identify with it. Not think, oh, this is me, oh, I'm such a mess. It's not useful and it's not true. You know, it's just a pattern of behavior and a pattern of thought that came from so many causes and conditions. You know, the way our innate ignorance has functioned over countless lifetimes, all of our experiences up until now. You know, so really like shake off any idea of, oh, I'm a mess. Think, afflictions are messy, afflictions are damaging. They don't function, they're dysfunctional. Um, so if I catch them, I can squash them or transform them. And if I can catch them in myself, I will have more like sympathy or affinity or compassion for other people when I see them behaving under the influence of these afflictions. I won't judge them so harshly because I know what they do to me. Make sense? So we have to just keep coming back to that. Otherwise, this process of self-examination can start to feel really heavy, you know? And when it feels really heavy, um, depending on our personality, we might feel really heavy and get depressed, or feel really heavy and get, like, rebellious, and think, ah, well, anyone, everyone's like this, yeah? Bah, and just behave even worse, yeah? What is the point? So, um, so you either become depressed or you become rebellious, um, or you can become really like um, like an old-fashioned school teacher who's like, yeah, really judgmental of others. So um, if, if your mind slides into any of these ways of being, um, know that uh, you've over-identified with your afflictions. Um, we first did um, Hungry Ghosts. What came up for you when we were looking at this kind of addiction mind or this miserly tight mind? Could you find it in yourself, even if you're not, you know, a heroin addict, but you could find some little addictive tendencies in yourself? Especially when you have a goal, mm. it's never enough. You mm. want more and more and more, and also it's like a tunnel vision yeah. when you don't see anything but that goal that you have. Yeah, exactly. So, 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 so. You achieve that goal, you have a good result, that doesn't make you happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the hungry ghost mind. Yeah. And, you know, there are other times in your life where you have had goals with a more relaxed mind, and you either achieved them or you didn't achieve them, but you were sort of happy with the process. And the, the goal stopped being even the main thing, you were just enjoying the process. You know, when you've had kind of a lighter touch. So, yeah, so this hungry ghost mind is tricky because we want to have goals, you know, and we want to have things that we're pursuing and things that we're interested in, and, you know, there's no problem with that. It's just that um, with over-identification and with attachment, we can get really uh, fixated. And if it's not really a goal, if it's more like um, looking for satisfaction or looking for entertainment or looking to be filled, that's even more um, common, it, just in your everyday life. Um, it could be that there are a lot of things in our life that we have resistance to and we don't like, and we're sort of getting through them with um, an idea that sometime in the day there will be relief. Yeah, I'll just get through this, and then I'll get home, and when I'm home I'll put my feet up and I'll watch this thing and then I'll be happy. 
you know, and we're just kind of like getting through the day, looking forward to this pocket of illusory peace, rather than looking at how can we be happy within a day that has activities that we don't enjoy. You know, um, so if the mind is all full of miserliness, then when it gets home, and it's say that you've made a plan that you're going to go home, put your feet up, and watch something on Netflix, then if something interferes with that plan, it's like it interferes with your happiness. Yeah, and say it's even something that you like. Say one of your friends calls you and says, hey, let's go for this hike in this beautiful place and see a beautiful waterfall. And you've been wanting to do it for weeks. And finally it's all come together and the weather is perfect and your friend is ready. Because your mind has gotten this tunnel vision like you described, it almost feels like the fun thing is interfering with your plan. Yeah? You're like, no, I'm home now. My feet are up. The shoes are off. It's too late. Sorry, I'm not going out. Yeah, and, and we you know can even feel like um, the people that we desperately want to talk to, then they might text us, and we're like, oh, the phone, I'm not even looking at it. Yeah, because you've gotten so tight in the mind yeah, that you even ruin the things that actually are usually conditions for your happiness. Yeah. So again and again, we have to check. What is the substantial cause of something and what is the condition for something? Because they are very different. And the substantial cause is always within your own mind. The condition can be any number of things, but we usually give all of the power to the condition. Yeah, and, it, and we think it's because I've had a big day, that's why I'm unhappy. Or I've had a big day, that's why I'm angry. Or because I'm sitting here watching this, that's why I can be relaxed. Forgetting that it, there was a whole decision process that happened, and then we believed it, and now it's true. And it was a sequence of events. Yeah. So this um, addict mind is really interesting, because it takes something that worked once, and then it wants to manufacture it again and again. Just like an addict, right? Um, if you've ever had any kind of addiction, you're kind of chasing the first time. Yeah, the best high, the first high, you're trying to chase that, and so you're trying to put the conditions together to get that one feeling you had once, whether it's in a job, or a relationship, or religious experience, spiritual experience, you know, you're trying to get that feeling that you call happiness by manipulating circumstances that seem like they would do it, you know, as if happiness had a very, um, external set of ingredients like a cake, yeah? And if I just put these right percentages in, then I'll get that exact feeling I had that one time that I was happy, and I'll be able to replicate it again and again, yeah? And it's easy to then believe that that's possible because replicating the same external things does create a similar experience sometimes. Yeah, but if it was all about the external, it would work exactly the same way every time. You know? So we want to really take the power back from external objects and people and situations. And that will help eliminate that hunger that hungry ghost mind. And one of the biggest ways to overcome this miserly mind that like hoards the happiness or hoards the conditions for happiness, that kind of um, gets scared of losing things, is to consciously practice generosity. <clears throat> Remembering that in Buddhism, generosity is the intention to give. It's not actually having something and giving it. It's having this intention to give. So it's got a really... Um, open-hearted readiness. That makes sense, right? So it could be that what you're giving is just time, or energy, or safety, or love. But you have this readiness, this openness. And then you don't feel like people are interrupting you anymore. If somebody wants something from you, you're already in the mood to give something, so you're almost happy to be asked. You're like, yeah, I was ready. You know that feeling when you're just in a really happy, generous mindset? And it, it can feel, self-cherishing can kind of tell us that you need to look after yourself, you need to look after yourself. Because you do need to look after yourself, and that's practical. But it gets really tight about it. 
and it starts to get very specific about what it needs, and then anything unexpected feels like interruption or interference. So we have to break that illusion by consciously practicing generosity and having this kind of abundant mentality of, um, I actually have so much, so much more than what I need, so much more. What do you need? Do you need anything? Take it. And if you don't need it from me, that's okay. I'm just here radiating abundance, you know? So it's counterintuitive. When you're in a hungry ghost mind, all you want to do is keep what you have. Because you're scared that if you let it go, you'll let go of happiness. And if as soon as you feel that, you say, is that true? Do I have what I need to sustain life? Do I have what I need to connect and feel enriched? Okay. I'm fine. Yeah. And then, what can I give? And often it is just time. You know, time is one of the easiest things we can give to people. You know, real, steady presence. Um, because we're so distracted lately. Yeah, we have so many more ways to become distracted. And so if you choose not to be distracted and to give someone your full attention for once, it can be one of these just really touching moments in time, even more than maybe it was 10 or 20 years ago, because of how much more distracted we are now. Yeah, even something as simple as when you're texting someone to really think about what you're texting. And to not hit send right away. But to think, is this going to give them maximum happiness? Like, oh, I'll add one more emoji then, actually. They would like the kitten one. Okay. But, you know, just that mentality that thinks, I'm not just ticking things off a list, or I'm not just running through activities, but actually focusing on who's in front of me, what do they need. It makes you happy. And it makes you slow down. And when you slow down, you're actually more efficient. This is a hard lesson for us to learn, that when you slow down, you're more efficient. And it's another way of feeling abundant, because some of our anxiety is feeling like we don't have time, we don't have time. Yeah? That anxiety that we can get into. So if we can just start offering time, we're also offering ourselves time. Yeah? So generous... The intention of generosity, the first benefit is to you, because you feel abundant as soon as you feel generous. And then everyone around you feels like they're not interrupting. They don't have to tiptoe around you. You know what I mean? They feel like they can ask you things. They feel like they can tell and share you things. So this is uh, getting out of hungry ghost thinking. Um, what came up for you when we were doing getting out of animal thinking or this kind of cloud of ignorance or this kind of hedonistic way of thinking where you're all about consumption? What came up? Were you surprised how much of your life is like an animal? Mm. He thought about this part when it seems that you want to rest mm. and you sit in front of the TV and you do nothing. Mm. It's not that you are resting, it's that yeah. you are like doing nothing. But, uh, sorry? We're like half entertained? Yeah, but what do you mean? Like that? To, to keep trying the same activity to get some relaxation feeling. Like it doesn't work perfectly, but it works enough to keep trying. Did you reach a moment when you feel like I wasted three hours doing nothing? And then uh, you're fill, filled with guilt, and now you're tired. Yeah. And and I think that uh, being able to define what is something actually relaxing and what is something entertaining, and when am I? consciously choosing, I want to be entertained, so I'm going to do something entertaining. And then you do it with all of your attention, completely enjoy it, and then finish. Yeah? 
rather than this kind of like half relaxed, half entertained, I'm really not sure what to do with my life, but I'm too tired to organize anything else. <laughs> yeah, which is really normal, right, and really common. But um, what it does is it kind of steals mental power. And so then your creativity is shrunk. And um, we're not very good at being bored anymore. But if you let yourself be bored, then you become creative again. And you start to think, oh yeah, I wanted to read that one interesting book, or I wanted to write this letter to my friend about this idea, or actually, I just need a nap. You know, it becomes clear what you actually need. Yeah? Um, and a lot of the time we do entertaining things when really we should just sleep or let ourselves be bored. So this, it's not like there's anything wrong with entertainment in and of itself. It's just that we use it as a substitute for other things we actually need. Sometimes it's a substitute for like human connection, you know? Like we have good friends in our life, but it's difficult with good friends to maintain communication and intimacy and, you know, make sure everyone's getting along. Easier to just watch a TV show where that's happening and it takes no work from us. And, you know, we can enjoy these different characters, and we can enjoy their drama, and we can enjoy them having problems, and then coming to solutions, and not have to do any of that in our own life. Because who's got that kind of energy? Yeah, but sometimes we're looking to entertainment um, as a substitute for many things missing in our life, and it's hard to identify that unless you give yourself space to be bored. So just, you know, gently with a sense of humor, you start to notice that you're, um, you know, making your life smaller and uh, less rich by certain habits. And then you just naturally start to find ways out of that pattern, I think. You know, just leave the house. <laughs> Go for a walk in the park, you know, go to a class on something, yeah. talk to people. Yeah. And you know, so then it's not like then you have to force yourself to stop doing a behavior. It's that your life becomes so full, you just naturally stop doing it. It's a much more effective strategy. Your life is too full, you're too happy then you don't rely on these different activities that actually don't work. But if you say to yourself, oh, I'm not allowed to watch TV anymore, or I'm not allowed to scroll through my Facebook feed anymore, I'm not allowed, I'm not allowed, then you're just depriving yourself of the only uh, sort of touchstone you've given yourself. Yeah? And now you're just all by yourself, like, <laughs> what do I do? Yeah? So instead of saying, I can't do this, I can't do that, say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, other things, more rich things, and then you'll find very naturally those little things just start to fade. Slowly, slowly. <laughs> so, um, like this, um, ignorance is hard to overcome, um, because we are pretty much animals but also to give yourself a little kick in the bum um, by realizing that if we live exactly like animals, then actually we aren't animals. And by living that way, we cause a lot of harm. If we just live consuming and consuming and trying to you know, build the most beautiful shelter and trying to get the best mate and doing things in a completely animal way, we destroy the planet. <coughs> Animals can live that way and not heart things, right? They're allowed. Yeah, they can just live their life and follow their instincts and they're not causing trouble, right? It's all in a good balance. But for us to live that way, we actually cause a lot of harm. So it's almost like we're really not allowed to be animals now that we're human. Yeah, we need to kind of step up into our own evolution. Yeah, take some responsibility for our own evolution. 
and realize that um, we're more than that, and we need to take advantage of that. Otherwise, we actually cause a great deal of harm. Yeah, so just a little gentle kick in the bum, you know? Because of course, natural to seek food and shelter and companionship and blah, 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 all these things. But if we do it from an animal mind, then we're just consuming, consuming, consuming. And not putting any beauty back. And not being sustainable. And then we have um, hell realms. Um, what did you think about these kinds of anger? The one like fire and the one like ice? Did you find yourself more one than the other, or balanced? Balanced. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Yo soy más de fuego. Fire. Yo soy fire. Sí. Because we're in Spain. <laughs> in Sweden, it's all ice. <laughs> In Australia, it's nice balance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In general, times when she gets angry, she feels isolated. But sometimes when there is a whole group that feels anger against something, mm -hmm. she feels she belongs to that group. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's really true, isn't it? It's so tempting to give in to lower forms of connection because it's connection. Yeah. yeah. And so it's so natural. Yeah. Um, and it's like what we were talking about in activist communities, you know, or um, trauma communities, um, or any minority community. It's, it's just so nice to feel connected. And sometimes it takes anger to get you all together. Um, so if you find yourself in one of these communities that has come together through anger, you know, acknowledge the humanness and the naturalness of that. And then see what can you do to um, upgrade the conversation now that you're in it. Yeah? Say, so, okay, we all started with anger, and that was human and natural, but what's a way to now move our connection into a higher form? Yeah? Not to negate what brought you there, you know, it's normal, but to kind of not stay there forever. You know, because, for example, if you identify as a victim of whatever kind of prejudice, a victim of, and you start to find your people, yeah, and then you're like, oh, I found my people, we're all victims of whatever it is. It's like, oh, such a relief, my people. But then you can stay there so long that you become just one more part of the problem that says us and them. You know, and now you are against whoever is victimizing rather than seeing them as also victims of something else which made them into perpetrators. You know, it's so easy. It's so easy. So, um, yeah, I, I think that it's a very important point that um, often we come together, maybe not for the best of reasons, but that doesn't mean we have to stay connected in for that reason. We can change our reason for connection. And the more you do that work internally, the more I think you bring that out of people. Yeah, just, you know, really gently. But, and without, you know, judging people who still seem to need to just stay with their anger, you know, because you don't want to suppress it either, do you? To pretend that you're not angry when you're angry doesn't work. Yeah. That's it. Have we ever tried? I'm not angry. It's fine. 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 And it's all dependently arisen and doesn't exist as harming from its own side. Um, the anger that is like ice is also really problematic because it could look like patience. Yeah, it could be like you're pretending to be patient, but actually you're just angry as anything, just being passive about it. You know, quiet, polite anger that's just locked down, freezing people out of your heart. And I think that becomes more common as we get older. You know, maybe when we're younger, our, our anger is more like fire, and then as we get older, it can kind of get a bit more like ice, because we're trying to be polite or professional or something. 
sometimes, depending on culture. You might stay fire all your lives because you're but, um, the, this can happen, and there can also be um, gender differences. You know, sometimes uh, in some cultures, men are more like fire, women are more like ice. In some cultures, it swaps. You know. So, you know, it really depends on these things as well. But to acknowledge that there's a time when um, our reaction to not getting what we want is to punish people by withdrawing our affection. So it doesn't look like we're attacking, but we're withdrawing our love, which is, can be just as harmful. Yeah. And it's a form of punishment, right? And then when you do what I want, I will reward you with my heart. Yeah. It's a little bit dodgy. Hmm. Yeah. But, you know, human. Yeah. So, when we're working through anger, there's um, kind of three main antidotes to anger, talked about in Buddhism, in the sutra tradition. Uh, one is patience. The other is love. And then what cuts right to the um, essence of it is the wisdom realizing emptiness. And it's realizing the emptiness of inherent existence. So we'll talk a bit about that um, more tomorrow, because it's also the antidote to all other afflictions as well. Um, but uh, love and patience, those are pretty accessible concepts. But thinking, them, thinking of them as ways to prevent anger or ways to diffuse anger can be really productive. Do you have um, objections or worries or questions on that line? Anger can be very hard because it's very analytical and certain of itself. Yeah. So we have to really challenge the false logic of anger by seeing anger in isolation from a situation that made us angry or people that made us angry. We have to kind of look at it as a separate entity and look at what it does to us and look at what it does to our relationships and see the way actually it's fueled by a false logic, not a true logic. So, you know, anger will say things like, it's only right I should retaliate because they are just that kind of bad person. Which would be like uh, being angry at fire for burning you when you touch it. If it's just its nature, you can't help it. And then anger goes the other way and says, oh, it's not their nature. They're doing something completely out of character. Yeah, this isn't like them. How dare they behave this way? And then you're angry and you feel your anger with that kind of analysis. Or they don't do this to everyone, they only do it to me. Well, then it would be just as justifiable to be angry at smoke for temporarily obscuring the sky. Yeah, that seems silly because it's passing by, it's gone already. Who is it you're angry at? It was the person that existed five moments ago. Yeah, not the one in front of you now. You meant angry at a memory. And over-identified with how you think you need to be treated in order to be happy. So it's tricky because it's like we all deserve respect. We all deserve to be treated well. Not just deserve, but it's logical because of interdependence. And at the same time, we shouldn't really expect people to treat us well. We should expect people to be self-centered, because that's the reality. Yeah, so then when people behave really well and politely and with respect, it's amazing. They have one second of not thinking of themselves first, it's amazing. So we should throw a party. We are now going um, into a bit more depth. <clears throat> and so if you have your uh, picture of the Wheel of Life in front of you, um, we're just going to review very briefly what we did yesterday, and then uh, go into a little bit more about how these function. So first we started with ignorance. Um, what do you understand by this concept of ignorance so far? What is it? According to 
how Christian is everything that you are not able to see due to your lack of, of deep uh, wisdom. Mm. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, so, that's a really good one. Yeah. Um, you know, in, uh, in the Buddhist tradition, we talk about many different kinds of ignorance. Um, there is the um, worst ignorance, which is the root of samsara, or the root of cyclic existence. And this is the, um, the ignorance that views the self in your own mental continuum and then holds it to exist inherently. So it views the conventionally existent self and then it projects inheritance on top of it. So the conventionally existent self is also empty of inherent existence, but it does exist conventionally. And so this ignorance sees this, you know, fine convention, which doesn't need to be really um, argued with at this point, and then it superimposes or adds a quality to it that it actually doesn't have. It makes it think that it's independent and self-sufficient and, I don't know, self-powered or spontaneous, that there's some sort of core permanent entity that gathers experiences to it, or, um, you know, has some kind of process, but that there's some sort of tiny core that is always unchanging. And that is uh, the big mistake that then leads to the creation of karma. And the reason it leads to the creation of karma is that if you think that you're independent and self-sufficient and, you know, some sort of standalone entity, then you need to protect it. If you don't realize the way that we're interconnected, if you don't realize the way we're interdependent, then um, it becomes very natural that things that appear to be a threat, even though they aren't, we must push away. Things that appear to benefit, even though it doesn't exist that way inherently, we want to pull towards. And that push and pull is really the essence of attachment and aversion, which are kind of the first problems that flow on from the initial ignorance. So, <clears throat> this ignorance is really important to understand kind of general ignorance. There's ignorance of cause and effect, which leads us to create all sorts of negative actions. But it's the ignorance of reality that is kind of the root of the problem. So, how are you guys doing with ignorance so far? <laughs> is it coming clear? Do you want to ask anything about it? Cle clear enough, just, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just a matter of uprooting it. Yeah. Um, and then we had um, karmic formations, which are sometimes called compositional activity. <clears throat> and so this kind of karma, um, we're talking about positive karma, we're ca talking about negative karma, we're causing, uh, talking about something that is maybe neutral, um, but we're all talking about different kinds of karmic weights as well. That's why the picture was the man, many different sizes of pots. Um, but if someone was to say to you, what is karma? What would you say? Just kind of in a simple, everyday way. The intention with which we act, we do things. Really good, yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's the mental factor of intention, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> and it's also then the verbal and physical actions that flow from that, but the main thing is mental intention, isn't it? So then what is this law of karma? What does it say? Which is just a natural law. It's not like something imposed by an external figure. But what's kind of the rule of karma? It acts upon consequences. Yeah, acts have consequences. For example, if I kill, mm -hmm. suffire in my salud physica or in other life or in this life. Mm -hmm. or exactly. And uh, a good example or a happy example? Yeah. If I'm generous, if I give, I will receive. I will have abundance. No? Yeah. Exactly. So, so we know this basic idea, right, that positive beneficial actions lead to happiness, negative destructive actions lead to suffering. The problem is that we don't understand the timing. Yeah? Because we might be quite nice, good people doing lots of good things and still be experiencing a lot of hardship. So it can make us then question karma and not really understand the way it functions and what makes an old karmic seed ripen into a present-day experience, right? That's where the confusion is. 
So we all understand kind of the basic idea of karma, right? But then in our everyday life, we might be confused about, well, I'm doing the best I can. Why do I have this headache? Right? Or I'm nice to people and kind. Why are they always critical? You know, and there's a lot of um, surface reasons why that could be, psychological reasons why that could be, and then there's these deeper karmic reasons why that could be. So the question, why do bad things happen to good people, or good things happen to bad people, you know, this is where we need to start fleshing out karma a little bit. Yeah, so <clears throat> have you had questions like that before, kind of in your mind of, okay, I get, I get karma in general, but... How come in my life things aren't going exactly as I want, even when I seem organized with my mental states? Do you have this question sometimes? Or how do I make karma work for me? This increasing process of karma. Why? It's not just immediate and finishes nothing. You don't purify the Yeah, the yeah. You, you've heard about this magnification of karma. Yeah. There's these, um, I think you're referring to the four certainties of karma, yeah? So um, the four certainties of karma, first one is that karma is definite, which is what we just talked about. Positive actions lead to happiness, negative actions lead to suffering. That's definite or certain. It's one of the four certainties of karma. Um, another one is that we don't experience the result of actions we haven't created the cause for. So if something is happening to us, we definitely were creating the cause for it. Or, you know, this mental continuum created the cause for it. So, okay. Yeah, good. Um, actions once done, don't go to waste. That's another of the four certainties of karma. Meaning that uh, once you've done a complete karmic action, it's like a little seed traveling on your mental continuum, waiting for the conditions to germinate or ripen. And it's not going to go away, even if it's a thousand years. It's just going to hang out there on your mental continuum, ready for conditions for it to sprout into experience. Right. Then the fourth one is the one that you were mentioning, which is that karma magnifies. And this is kind of the um, most bewildering one for us. Yeah, this is kind of like, well, why would that be? I did the one thing, why don't I get just the one effect? But we need to always kind of use this model of looking at karma like a seed in the natural world. That from one tiny seed comes a big giant tree with many fruit. Yeah, many branches. And so, you know, it'll just keep growing in the style of the seed itself, right? It's not going to suddenly turn into a different species. Yeah, it's going to always be growing in the same species. But it'll keep growing unless something cuts its vitality or until its potency itself finishes. Yeah. And so if you can think about the magnification of karma in the same way as in the natural world, that, you know, these things have a tendency to expand. Once they ripen, they just keep growing and growing and growing. Which isn't to say they can't be purified or they can't be ended, but kind of once something is ripened, it's really <coughs> going to keep going until we address it. So <clears throat> the magnification of karma also can be looked at um, from the perspective of something negative clearing out a whole bunch of positive karma. We've heard this, right? That one moment of anger destroys a huge amount of positive karma. Have you heard this? It's terrible news. Um, <laughs> it's terrible news. Because anger is kind of like reverse purification. Yeah, so purification is a process we do for um, negative karma to not ripen into suffering, right? It's a way of burning those seeds so that you don't have to experience the suffering of your past mistakes. So it's amazing. We can clear out negative seeds. We actually don't have to experience the results of negative karma if we purify them first. Phew, right? But there also has to be a reverse process for positive karmic seeds. Yeah? It's not like it can only go one way. And you can burn your positive karmic seeds through anger. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's an incredibly powerful, unfortunate, destructive emotion. But think about how you could have a friendship lasting 20 years end with one really big argument. You know, so all of those years of love and affection and momentum and communication and shared experiences gone in one really bad argument. It happens, doesn't it? So thinking of karma in a similar way, you know, that that really strong moment of anger wiped out a huge amount of your past positive deeds. Yeah. 
I heard another example mm. because it, it was said that Buddha uh, taught to, to many uh, uh, call traders or, mm. or people that traded with, with goods and in the case of a loan. If mm. you ask for a loan yeah, and you don't give it back, the interest keeps, ah, keeps growing and yeah, growing yeah, and growing. Yeah. So they could understand that perfectly. Yeah, that's a really good way of See, explaining. Yeah, tell them. Yeah, mm -hmm. See, Karma, what are your uh, thoughts? Good news, bad news? Well, <laughs> uh, once you realize an action, there is a cause, how is decided? Yeah. <laughs> What type of effect is going to happen? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, predetermined or is mm -hmm. it the interdependence of all the yeah. factors? Uh, uh, depends on the person. Mm. Yeah, this is exactly the sort of question we should ask. Because we're trying to get into how does cause and effect work together with emptiness. Yeah, everything is lacking kind of self-existence, right? Everything exists in context. Yeah, in relation to. And yet, cause and effect functions. Like it functions in the natural world. It's nobody nobody decided. It's just the way the natural world works, is that <clears throat> if you do a destructive action, there is destructive energy. If you do productive or creative or constructive action, it leads to happiness. This is just kind of the way the natural world works. It's not a punishment and it's not a reward. And that kind of makes sense to us from a distance. Distance, right? But then you get into the specifics of daily life and what is helpful and what is harmful, and it's not so clear, is it? You know, what is um, very harsh speech to one person might be entertaining speech to another. Yeah, like think of the way that we um, have such varied opinions about what is funny if we're all going to a comedy show. Yeah. So the same joke for some people will be offensive, for some people will be boring, for some people will be hilarious, all given their context, right? So with karma, we're not really looking at what the immediate effect is in terms of deciding whether it's good or bad. We're looking about what the immediate intention was from the person doing it. Yeah. That's where it gets tricky, because if we're um, classifying things based on the effect they have in the external world in the immediate, it, it becomes um, too tangled. We can only kind of go back to where did it start from, right? And that's complicated too. But if the intention was to be of benefit, it's a beneficial action. If the benefit was harm, it's a harmful action. The problem is we can't read people's minds. Yeah. That's the problem. So we can't know what their motivation was. All we can do is say, how can I use whatever is happening as a way to fuel my own path? And to understand that karma is actually a more subtle thing to understand than emptiness. Emptiness is very subtle, <clears throat> but even more subtle is karma. Yeah. What, what are all of the strands of cause and effect that came into this one moment that we're having here together. Yeah, what brought us here into this room at this time? Could we list all of the conditions? You know, all the way back to our parents' meeting, all the way back to their parents' meeting, all the way back, all the way, you know, like all of the causes and conditions that brought us into this moment. It's almost infinite, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas things being empty of inherent existence, because they're dependently arisen, is a subtle kind of an idea, but is actually easier to grasp and easier to realize. So it's said that only a completely omniscient Buddha can see all of causation. Whereas um, someone much earlier on the path, an Aryan being, someone who's realized emptiness directly, they, they can understand emptiness without being omniscient yet. So, a little bit of karma we have to take on faith based in reason and experience. Not just a blind faith, but there is an element of faith there which is seeing that it makes sense, there's a type of logic to it, but we actually can't prove it to ourselves experientially yet. So we just hold it like a Venerable Rabina would say, we hold it as a work of theory. Because it leads to good ethics. Yeah. Motivation is fundamental for bad karma. It's like if you don't, you are not 
You are, don't realize the implications of your actions. Yeah. It doesn't do you so bad karma, or it's, it's going don't, to, don't you, know, you don't you notice later. You realize, or yeah, it's you know the main factor is your intention or um, your motivation or your reason. But it's um, there are a few actions that are what are called natural misdeeds. So take for example killing. You could think. Um, Lots of people do this, right? Lots of people have this motivation that I'm going to um, put my pet down, I'm going to kill my pet because they're old and they're suffering and maybe they have kidney failure and because I love them and I don't suffer, I'm going to take them to the vet and kill them. Lots of people do this, right? Probably most of us in this room at some point in our life have had an animal killed out of a compassionate reason. Was it a compassionate reason? That's another conversation. It could have been a reason of convenience that we called compassion. But anyway, pretend it's compassion. Killing is still a natural misdeed. And so it will still have the effect of, in the future, a shortened life, of illness, of um, the potential to be killed yourself. It'll still have those effects. But because your intention was compassionate, theoretically, say it was compassionate, then that karma is less heavy. Yeah, so there's many criteria for what dictates a heavy karma or a light karma. So if uh, we kill a cat as a human being, it's, not, it's a much heavier karma than if a wolf kills a cat, right? Because a wolf eats meat, and it's not having this intention to harm, it's having this intention to eat, right? And it's part of the way their karmic disposition is structured, they have a lower level of mental intelligence, etc., etc. So the same action is going to have a different effect for them than it would for us. So intention is one of the biggest factors in um, the criteria for karmic weight, but there are a lot of other factors as well, like who you are as a person with that intention. You know, what are your qualities and characteristics, um, etc. Who are you doing it towards? You know, there's certain objects that are heavier than others. For example, if you do an action of generosity, it's a very positive action that will bring resources in the future. But if you're generous towards a very sick person, it's even bigger good karma than if you're generous towards someone who doesn't particularly need your help. It's good in both cases, right? But the object also has an influence on how heavy the good karma is. So a lot of it would kind of go along with your common sense and what you would assume would be the case. Um, occasionally there's a karmic case where you're sort of surprised when you read in the text, like, oh, right, is that heavier? Okay. Wouldn't have thought that. But there's always some sort of logic underneath it that will make sense. Yeah. You have a question? Um, I think it's a bit complicated as well when you, when you talk about it, because we tend to think that everything is karma. And uh, it's not like that, right? Because it's like there are things that, that are sort of uh, neutral as well. There is neutral karma. But uh, it, that sounds really weird because there's always some kind of intention in every action that you do. Even though it's not really conscious, it could be there somehow like an intention. Yeah, no, everything is karma. Or maybe you, you, you started an intention way before mm -hmm. and uh, you don't really think about it, but you keep doing the action. Not having the intention right in the moment. Like, uh, the intensity of the of the <coughs> that's what sometimes I think the intensity of your intention is also important. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> yeah, and the whole karma like structure. I'm going to go into in another session. What dictates karmic weight? What makes a complete karmic action? All that stuff is its own conversation and it's really important. Um, but, I mean, the short answer is pretty much everything is karma, right? There's not non-karmically created things. It could be a mixture as well of, of intensity and, and uh, uh, the intentions that... It, the short answer is that your right intensity has an influence, but you're wrong in thinking that there is something that isn't karma. Is it? Everything is karmically related. But for example, if I try, I do like this, and, and I hit with, with my, yeah. the, the mouth of someone and hurt that person, yeah. it was not my intention, it was an accident. Exactly. But that, that is not karma, is it? Well, it is karma. It's it was the karma of that person. It was both. 
But if, uh, do I create negative karma? Well, if, if your intention was, I'm going to move my arm, that's not negative yeah, yeah, I don't realize that it was yeah, someone behind. But it's, so it's, it's neutral karma for you, and then they're ripening old negative karma for them. Right. Whereas if you saw them and were like, ah. <laughs> yeah, then obviously it's negative karma. And negative karma ripening for them. Yeah, but you know, these kind of like, quote, unintentional actions that we do, they still have intention in them, they're just not very conscious to us. You know, even all my little hand gestures here, you know, it's not like I'm thinking, I will touch my head and go like this. It's just kind of coming naturally as um, my habit of expression. But it's still karma, ripening and karma being created. It's just quite light. Yeah, because there's not a strong positive or negative intention behind it. Although I think sometimes when I really want to uh, express myself, if I really want to connect and benefit, my hands become wilder. So maybe that physical action is positive. Maybe, I don't know. But you know, so intensity obviously has an impact on how heavy or light a karma is. But every moment of every day we're creating karma. Every moment of every day we're experiencing old karma ripening. This is really important to understand. Yeah, there's neutral karma. Yeah, there's neutral karma. So it's not good, not bad? Yeah, exactly. So it's like nothing. It's not like nothing. <laughs> neutral is not nothing. Don't oversimplify. And what is neutral? What is neutral then? Well, like for example, uh, sleep, the mental factor of sleep is um, karmically neutral, but then it can become positive or negative based on your kind of decision before you fall asleep. Um, the mental factor of investigation can be neutral, positive or negative, depending on your motivation. Right? There's a lot of neutral karma in the form and formless realms. Yeah, karma is subtle, man. Don't oversimplify it. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a complex thing, but there is no escaping a moment where karma isn't at work. Because there is no moment without mind. Yeah. yeah but for example, when, 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 I, when I do an action, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe if, even if I don't do the action, but I start, for example, thinking about something not very positive that I want to do, mm -hmm. and I start sort of fighting it inside my yeah. head, uh, uh, that, that thought that is not becoming an action, mm -hmm. but is sort of fighting between you know, what I have to, for example, if I want to answer to someone in a bad way, and I say, no, 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 I can't do this because of that, you and think I start that reasoning, it's so not that, uh, maybe... You think that mental activity is not action? Yeah, it is action, but it's not. It's not. I'm, I'm reasoning. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find out a way of sort of, you know, you doing want the to right thing. Yeah. You want but to escape a consequence for thoughts that you're not proud of. Yeah, but my intention is for example, maybe, <laughs> even if I'm, if I'm having oh, like bad thoughts, you're not my intention at the end is like doing the, the best thing I can do. You're not listening to that. I think that you analyze yourself into knots. Sorry? I think you analyze yourself into knots. Okay. And you have to remember that every moment of thought is karma. And of course, it's good that you don't act on your bad thoughts. Of course, it means that it's lighter. Yeah, but every moment of thought is creating karma. And repetitive thoughts are stronger because of the repetitive nature. And this, uh, you know, you just have to be really honest with yourself that just because it's a thought doesn't mean it doesn't matter. But if it's a thought that you move on from and let go and transform, then no worries. And we do our Vajrasattva practice every night. Clean slate, let go, move on. You know, I think sometimes we overanalyze everything, trying to make bad things good, when in fact it's much easier and much more logical to just say, that bad thing was bad, I'll stop. Yeah, but we're so conditioned by Judeo-Christian culture to have guilt. Yeah. And guilt is actually, can be a way that we hang on to negative habits by paying the price of feeling bad about it. Yeah, I'm allowed to keep doing this bad thing if I sort of feel bad about it. That's one element of guilt. Whereas regret says, this is the wrong thing. 
if I see that it's wrong, I should start quitting it. It's a little bit simpler and cleaner, but it's more challenging because you actually have to change. With guilt, you don't have to change. You just pay the price of feeling bad about it. You don't actually have to change anything. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, you know, so regret is liberating, but it's more work. Guilt is completely oppressive and exhausting and stagnating, but it doesn't ask as much of you in terms of change. But when you look at the Christian confession, mm -hmm. one of the factors is the, the, the how you call it, the posture I mean, that you, you, you have the intention to change. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not forgiven. It's not forgiven. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, even in Judeo-Christian culture, um, uh, people who are good Christians maybe don't make use of their own excellent practices to let go of guilt. Go to confession, let it go. Do your Hail Marys, right? But lots of people just, instead of doing that, just feel bad. Do you know what I mean? Like, we sort of don't kind of sit down and say, what have I done? Why did I do it? Can I stop? You know, just really clean, really tidy. It's much easier to analyze yourself into knots of justification. Of course I did this bad thing because this and this and this happened. Of course I did this bad thing because this and this and this happened. Pat, pat, pat. You know? Danger. It's really weird because if you're used to <clears throat> this kind of thought, uh, you, you get dropped into it and you feel even that you have to carry the burden or something like that. And you, when, you do the, when you don't do that, it's like uh, you, you feel sort of even uh, sort of uh, cold mm. towards it because it's like, you know, this and it's gone. The other way, you just carry it one time and, and you feel like you're failing sort of. <laughs> Yeah, Christ. Yeah. It is very self destructive. Exactly. It's not healthy and it's not useful. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll do a karma session soon, but yeah, we'll one more karma question. <laughs> Perhaps we should uh, have a greater mind instead of analyzing so much to let go. Uh, it's it's a delicate balance, you know, because you don't want to disassociate um, or s sort of push things under. But you know that you've perhaps analyzed enough when your thoughts begin to repeat. Right? So analyze something until you start saying the same thing again. Yeah, and if you start saying the same thing again, give it some space. Say, okay, I've obviously covered the amount of ground that my current wisdom is able to cover, and if I haven't come to a solution or an understanding or an answer, I'm not going to right now in this second. I need to sleep on it, I need to talk to someone, I need to go for a walk, I need to meditate single-pointedly on the breath, but stop analyzing, because you're not breaking any new ground. Yeah. And so... Um, you know, if you're the friend to someone who is going over a problem, this is the same technique, isn't it? You listen to their whole story, but as soon as they start to repeat themselves, say, okay, so, <laughs> yeah. a little bit of a, you know, redirection or interruption or let's, let's give it some space. You know, when your friends start to repeat themselves and they say the same thing over and over again, listen to them really, really well the first time. Because sometimes people repeat themselves because they don't feel heard, right? So listen really well the first time, but then once they start to repeat themselves, say, Darling, you're not breaking any new ground. Let's give it some space. I absolutely hear you. Here are the key highlights of what I've just heard, so you feel validated. And now let's do something else for a while. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I think you're quite right, we need to let go of stuff, but not with a squashing attitude. You know, we do need to analyze a little bit, just not get in that trap of just again, again, going over stuff, you know? Sometimes when we go over it again and again, we're trying to find that tiny grain of why we're not bad. Some tiny grain of, like, justification. It could be that we just had a completely bad motivation and did completely the wrong thing. Doesn't mean we're bad. It was a bad moment dependently arisen from many causes and conditions. 
So now you see that, you're not going to do it so much, eh? Yeah, yeah it's, it's very liberating to be able to say, I did this, it was a mistake, I'll stop. Like, you know? It's amazing to be able to just say that. You feel so um, confident and empowered just being able to say, I really made a mistake. That was completely the wrong thing. How often do we actually say that? We usually say, oh, it was, oh, and we kind of navigate around. It was, look, I know it wasn't the best, but actually, oh, I didn't really mean to, though. You know, we kind of wiggle out of taking responsibility. It saves so much time to just see a fault to be a fault. And if you see it clearly as a fault, it becomes very difficult to repeat it. You become embarrassed to repeat it. Whereas if you think it's only half bad, you'll do it again. Right? Yeah. So, karma. Then, um, plants a seed on your primary consciousness, which is the next link. So there are six primary consciousnesses that every individual has. Um, I primary consciousness, nose primary consciousness, etc., to mental primary consciousness. This one is the fundamental consciousness, the mental primary consciousness that we're talking about. <clears throat> yeah, is that clearish? Yeah. Okay, and then we have name and form, which is the five aggregates. Um, do you remember the five aggregates? One, two, three. Uh, form, feeling, discrimination, Formal. composition of factors in consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy. Um, and then six sources. I'm sure this is the, the result of your prior study. Six sources. So these guys, once the six sources are established, it's like the experiencer is established. It's not like there's no experience prior to this point in these developmental stages, but it's like once the six sources are established, the experiencer has been created because like the main homes of the body are now there, kind of the main rooms in the body are there. Um, so you had eye primary consciousness dormant in the mental, you know, kind of with the mental primary consciousness. Now when the six sources are being established, you start to have somewhere for the eye consciousness to live. And it might not actually see anything yet, like when you're a fetus developing in the womb, but you have like a house for your primary consciousness to operate through. So the six sources are like very, very subtle form. Yeah, they're not the actual like eye organ or nose organ, but they live in those areas, for example, for a human being, generally speaking. Yeah, and they, they become kind of the access point where then as the being develops into a full physical form, except in the formless realm, where you can actually move into contact, which is that meaning of the outside and the inside world. <clears throat> so when you have sensory object, sensory faculty and consciousness coming together, that is what contact is. And then feeling is what's saying, ooh, I like it. Oh, I don't like it. No, I don't really care. Yeah, or it's, this is happiness, this is suffering, this is neutrality. The feeling is a much stronger version of that initial good, bad, neutral. So you come into contact, and then you have a feeling, and then based on the feeling, you want or you don't want. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a linear sequence of events, but also you have all of this going on simultaneously. Yeah, so you know, you kind of have... There's a translation there. Is, uh, I always have this doubt. Somehow, sentimiento is more an emotion. Yeah. And in feeling is too. more the you mean physical feeling. Somehow. Well, physical or mental. Or mental. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's a sensation. pleasure and, and ple pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. More. Like um, sensation, not emotion. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and you know, it's difficult because um, in English and I think in Spanish too, there is just kind of a very short list of ways to describe. You know, there's um, emotions and there's feelings. You know, in Buddhism we talk about like the main 51 mental factors, which is not an exhaustive list, it's just like the main 51 that we talk about. You know, so um, 
still so feeling and emotion are not specific and enough to describe all the things we're talking about in Buddhism. There's a lot of things that in English or in Spanish we would call an emotion that in Buddhism we would just call a mental factor or um, several mental factors coming together that we would say is one emotion. But in Buddhism it's actually like three or four different things at the same time. Yeah. So it's um, uh, a lot more defined in Buddhism, their mental experience, which means there's a lot more areas to impose control and to change things. If you kind of make everything one big, this is an emotion, or this is a sensation, it's hard to kind of navigate how did it come about and how do I change it or keep it going. And so it's, um, anyway, it's important to think when we're talking about feeling in Buddhism, we're talking about pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, physical or mental experience. And then what you do with it and what you decide about it is something else. So, in Buddhism, love is not a feeling, it's a mental factor, it's a positive mental factor. And it comes together with a pleasant feeling, usually, but it doesn't have to. You can be thinking, may all beings have happiness, while not feeling particularly well, but because you think, may all beings have happiness, that becomes a strong condition to ripen an old, positive, negative karma, and in a few minutes you might have happiness. So this is the thing we don't understand about timing, is that what we're experiencing right now in this second is past ripened karma. Yeah, it's from the past. And then it met with the present conditions, external and internal. But actually what's happening internally and externally isn't the main reason we feel what we feel right now in terms of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Right? But then what we decide about this moment creates our future experience. It could create a very far in the future experience, but it's also a condition for a very short-term experience. Yeah? So say we decide, um, here's a beautiful chocolate, I want to give it to my friend to make them experience happiness, and you do that right now. Well, that's creating a positive potential on your mental continuum that will ripen in the future as resources. But your thought right now is a condition also. It's not just a cause. So it's a condition then, that generous attitude, for an old karma from who knows when in the past to ripen as happiness now. So there's this, you know, this interesting set of things happening simultaneously. The ripening of the past, the creation of the future, and all of the things happening here in the present are not very much about the present. Yeah? And yet we give all of the significance to the present and think that's why I feel this way. So this even works with basic psychology, doesn't it? Yeah, if you define something as this is a good moment or a bad moment, it's very conditioned by your history, isn't it? If you think someone is being kind to you right now, it's very conditioned by what you have been trained to think is kindness. So, you know, never mind karma, even just in everyday psychology, we know that this is true, that how we feel right now isn't really about right now. And what we decide to do with right now creates patterns for the future. So this can be really important if you can sit with it. Yeah. And then you stop trying to change uncomfortable feelings by manipulating the present external circumstance. You actually examine what's going on with my self-grasping and self-cherishing and adjust your thinking. And then wait. Yeah, because then a good karma is going to ripen if you have a positive mental attitude. But it's not going to ripen in this exact second. Yeah, you have to give it a minute because your old negative karma is finishing still. It's got to run out of gas. Sense? So, mental intention creates karma. The mental factor of feeling is where you experience karma. Yeah. So, feeling and intention are two important mental factors to understand because that's kind of where karma is operating in the most direct way. But it's operating everywhere, obviously, too. <coughs> so, you have feeling, and then feeling 
doesn't have to, but it usually leads to craving. So that's a really important junction or um, transition point. It is so profound if you can have a pleasant, happy experience physically and mentally and not generate craving. Yeah, to just experience it, to just enjoy it, to even um, think, I want to share it. This is what we're trying to do. But what we normally do is then immediately think, whatever is happening must be making me feel this way. I need more, I need more, I need more. Right? Which, you know, then turns into grasping, which nourishes potential existence, which leads to a negative rebirth. Right? But even just in daily life, we need to break this cycle of feeling immediately leading to craving. Yeah, craving for more good or craving to be separated from bad. So it takes understanding where the positive and negative experiences came from. Okay. So <clears throat> potential existence is also in the category of karma. And it's where um, things are kind of sleeping or latent in your mental continuum. And so they get nourished into birth by craving and grasping is what makes your potential existence ripen into a rebirth. And then as soon as you're born, you begin to age, and then you die. And at the time of death, that state of mind is um, the strong condition to ripen your old negative or positive karma for your next rebirth. And the whole thing, again, again, again. So these 12 links are divided into two lives. Yeah, so one very strong karmic action um, has the power to project an entire rebirth, or two entire rebirths, depending on how you're looking at it. Um, most of our karmas don't have the power for that. They more are going to ripen as what's called a completing karma, you know, kind of everyday experiences. But a strong karmic action involves kind of four main components. So there's the motivation, obviously. There is uh, the object you're doing the action toward. There is the affliction that's present, and there is completion. And so it might not seem like a big karma to us if a mosquito lands on our arm, we see it, we're angry about it, we want to kill it, we kill it, and are happy about it. Like, I got it, ha! That's a complete karma. Yeah? And that has the power to reject a negative rebirth and the power to project a negative rebirth that includes a shortened life and sickness. If at the time of death we are having negative mental attitudes. Yeah. So the time of death is really crucial for what seeds are you watering. Because we have tons of good, tons of bad, yeah, lots and lots of both. Um, but if we want a good future, we need to water the right seeds. So the time of death is a time we need to really be careful about maintaining mental peace. And even better, thinking of others. Even better than that, thinking of developing our spiritual path until enlightenment. Yeah. So this is important to know also if you're helping people who are in the last stages of their life, how to help them have a peaceful mind, to connect to whatever spiritual refuge they feel comfort with. We don't have to, you know, do some sort of deathbed conversion and turn them into Buddhists. No, it's not useful. We want to nourish whatever their existing spiritual path is. Yeah, something that uh, involves love, compassion, altruism, etc. And if they don't have any kind of spiritual refuge, they probably have spiritual refuge in something that they haven't defined as that, like maybe nature, or their relationships in their family, or certain kinds of music, or something like that. And so just think, what does this person need, given what I know about them, to have a peaceful and attached mind? And then you don't feel so helpless when you're with people that are dying also, you know? You can feel like, okay, what can I do to bring out the best of them in this really important time? It can be really joyful. Um, so, the 12 questions. Are they getting clearer? <laughs> Less clear. <laughs> There's, 
you know, the way to divide them is in um, this way that we're having some trouble translating, um, which is they can be defined as projecting and projected. Those are the ones that are circled in red. And actualizing or actualized, those are the ones in blue. <coughs> which are basically sets of cause and effect. Yeah, these are sets of cause and effect. So in the case of the projecting causes, what we have is ignorance, karmic formation, and consciousness are the things that project. Yeah, those are the things that launch. What is created or what is launched is named in form of six sources, contact, and feeling. Yeah. So based on ignorance, you create negative karma. The karma is planted on your mental consciousness. Yeah. So that's kind of the, um, the ingredients to begin. Yeah. And then <clears throat> what is created then is then the name and form, six sources, contact, and feeling. So that's kind of like one set. Yeah. And then we have um, the actualizing or um, the creating factors. So craving, grasping, and potential existence, these kind of nourish a seed that's been planted on your mental continuum, which then leads to birth, aging, and death, which are what are actualized. And so just kind of like get used to these words and then we'll unpack it more. Just kind of get used to this idea that of this 12, we're kind of talking about two sets of cause and effect. Yeah, just simply speaking, two sets of cause and effect. And if you know nothing else at the end of this, just know which ones are causes and which ones are effects, even if you don't know what goes where. Yeah. Um, and then the simplest example is to divide things into suffering, disturbing emotions, and karma. So there's a little circle at the bottom there that can be really useful. Because <clears throat> suffering <coughs> usually leads to a disturbing emotion, but it doesn't have to. A disturbing emotion usually creates negative karma, but it doesn't have to. Karma usually ripens as suffering, but it doesn't have to. So if you can even just keep those three in your mind, that at each of those points there is a chance to change the pattern. And if you miss your window, there's another chance coming. Yeah, does that sort of make sense? Yeah. So take, you know, for example, um, you're suffering with uh, attachment to cake. Yeah, and um, you know you're you're hungry, and you're then uh, it's turning into craving, and then that hungry craving is uh, turning into attachment and wanting more, and then you actually eat a whole bunch of cake and create the negative karma of uh, indulging in your attachments, and then that plants a seed on your mental continuum. And then down the track, you have attachment to food again, and then the suffering of that arises again, and it's a whole pattern. So what you're trying to do is then the next time you feel that kind of, oh, I really want that, I'm suffering, I'm suffering, I'm so hungry, you think, okay, what can I do differently this time? How can I break the pattern? Okay, so I'm just suffering right now, which is the past ripening result. How about I just let it finish and try not to create anything new for once? Yeah? What if I just like have a glass of water? Yeah? And if I'm actually hungry, why don't I eat good food that's healthy and going to make me happy in the sense of health and well-being? Yeah? And not out of attachment, but out of I need to be healthy to be of use in this world. Okay? So that's what you think, but then you fail. And then you binge again. So, you start to eat the cake, but then you stop yourself. Yeah, that's how to stop it from creating a huge amount of negative karma, right? As you just, okay, I'm going to stop this pattern. But then you fail. So, if you want to prevent the karma from turning into suffering, then you purify. Yeah, and you think, okay, whoops, I did the wrong thing, I did the whole same thing I've done a million times, but so it doesn't lead to suffering, I'm going to see a fault to be a fault. I'm going to connect with my spiritual refuge, I'm going to do some sort of remedy, and I'm going to make a promise I can keep about it, these four opponent powers, right? And then it's not going to lead to future suffering. So you can plug in any example, 
you know, of difficulties in your life that have this pattern of suffering leading to a disturbing emotion, leading to karma, leading to suffering, this whole cycle. And just ask yourself, where can I try something different? And it's nice to know that even if you miss your window of opportunity for change, okay, there's going to be another window of opportunity for change. And this is the way to start breaking samsara in a really practical way. But the easiest way, um, easiest is the wrong word, the best way to start breaking this cycle is to remember emptiness whenever you can. Yeah. That suffering doesn't exist from its own side. Disturbing emotions don't exist from their own side. Karma doesn't create from its own side. You know, all of these are dependently arisen. And so it's much easier to change your patterns if you realize that things are not as they appear. So we'll just kind of let it brew for a little bit. So we'll dedicate that all of this mental energy goes to the complete enlightenment of all sentient beings. <clears throat> What sort of categories do you obtain by abbreviating the factors? There are four types. The projecting factors, the projected factors, the actualizing factors, and the actualized factors. What are the projecting factors? Ignorance, compositional f activity, karmic formations, and consciousness. What are the projected factors? Name and form, the six sources, contact and feeling. What are the actualizing factors? Craving, grasping, and potential existence. What are the actualized factors? birth, aging, and death. Qualm, well then, do the two types of causality, one with respect to projection and the other with respect to actualization, demonstrate one instance of causality wherein one person takes rebirth, or do they demonstrate two instances? If the former, it would be incorrect to claim that the actualizing factors, craving, and so on occur after the establishment of the group of factors, beginning with resultant period of consciousness and ending with feeling the projected factors. If the latter, there would be no ignorance, compositional activity, or causal period consciousness projecting factors. In the latter cycle of causality, the ordering of projection of no craving, grasping, or potential existence actualizing factors. In the former cycle of causality, the ordering of actualization. Reply, there is no such fault, because whatever is projected by the projecting causes, ignorance, compositional activity, and consciousness, must be created by the actualizing causes, craving, grasping, and existence. When, by what is projected, name and form, the six sources, contact and feeling, has been actualized, it is that very thing, the projected, that is designated as being born, aging, and dying. Qualm, well then, what is the point of presenting two cycles of causality? Reply, such a presentation demonstrates that the characteristics of the true sufferings that are the effects of projection differ from those that are the effects of actualization. The former consciousness of the effect, period, name and form, the six sources and feeling are dormant at the time of projection. Since they have not actually been established, they will only become suffering in the future. However, the latter, birth, aging, and death, are situations in which suffering has been actualized, and hence are sufferings in this lifetime. Moreover, the two cycles of cause and effect were presented for the sake of demonstrating that the effect taking rebirth has two causes, projecting causes and causes that actualize what has been projected by the projecting causes. The level of yogic deeds states the reason for this. Given that the factors of birth, aging, and death, the groups of factors beginning with the resultant period consciousness and ending with feeling are phenomena with shared characteristics, why have they been taught it to be of two types? It is done in order to demonstrate the different characteristics of things that bring suffering and in order to demonstrate distinction. Projecting and projected should be understood by way of four considerations. What has been projected? Four and a half factors beginning with resultant period consciousness and ending with feeling have been projected. 
What has done the projecting? Compositional activity, which is dependent on ignorance, has done the projecting. How has a projection occurred? Projection has occurred by means of latent karmic propensities being infused in the causal period consciousness. Projected means having created the effects, resulted period consciousness, name and form, sources, contact and feeling, conducive to actualization once the actualizers, such as craving, are present. The actualizers and the actualized should be understood by way of three considerations. 1. What does the actualizing? It is done by grasping, which is caused by craving. 2. What is actualized? Birth and aging and death are actualized. 3. How does actualization occur? Actualization occurs by means of the empowerment of the latent karmic propensities that were infused in consciousness by compositional activity. Vasubandhu, in his explanation of the divisions of dependent arising, took the factor of birth as the only actualized factor, and then taught aging and death to be the faults of these factors of projection and actualization.